Yo, what's going on? Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Lisa Whiteman, a four-time Olympian for Team Australia in the marathon. Recently, Lisa ran the Osaka Marathon, placing third with a time of 2.24.43. And we'll go over her race in a recap form. We'll talk about the ASICS prototype shoes that she raced in. And we'll also discuss what this race might mean for her chances of being selected for a fifth Australian Olympic team. We also get into it a little bit deeper and talk about her Chicago connection and my favorite Australian TV show. I had a lot of fun with this conversation and I really hope that you enjoy it too. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I guess it's morning where you are. Uh, how are you doing? And can you tell everyone where you're saying hello to us from? Hi, it's great to be here. I'm in Osaka. I've got one day of holiday left before we head back to Australia. It's six o'clock in the morning, so trying to be bright and breezy on holiday. Uh, yeah, but we've had a lot to be bright and breezy about, so it's good to chat. Oh yeah, it's so great to talk to you. I've been following your career for a little while now. Uh, I, th I saw you race in person in Hungary over the summer, so I got to see you uh, at World Championships. Uh, I'm glad to finally get a chance to sit down and talk with you now. I, I won't take up too much of your time because I know you're on holiday after a, a fantastic race over the weekend. Were you able to finish uh, third place in the Osaka Marathon? Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, been a lovely day yesterday here, but uh, on race day, as you know, it was uh, a bit brutal with the cold, the, the wind and all the wet weather. So, uh, yeah, we were a bit uh, saddened to see that we could have had a nice day like yesterday. But, uh, you know, we had a competitive and fierce race and, and that will put me in good stead for any championship races for the coming years. So it may be a blessing. Let's let's go with that. Hey. Okay. Well, I mean, like com <laughs> coming back with a podium finish is never something to shake a stick at. Uh, and, and it looked like you had a, a really great performance out there. Can you give us a little bit of a breakdown in terms of the race and how it went for you and kind of whatever way makes sense, however you want to kind of chop it up into segments? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I guess it rewinds back to Valencia last year. So I was in really great shape, uh, training really well in December and had really high hopes for Valencia. Uh, and then on the way over, I got COVID. So I ran the race, not really realizing it was COVID, but feeling pretty terrible in the, you know, the three or three days leading up. So, uh, when I crossed the line, I just was so devastated to not be able to put that performance down. And, and so I said to my coach, Dick Telford and, and to Lachlan, my husband, we, uh, we've got to go again. And I, I don't know if they thought I was a bit crazy, but, uh, they all jumped on board and helped me with, you know, the, the short build, uh, to get back. And, and also just medically, I had to get a bit of help, uh, just to make sure that I was healthy enough to do another block. Uh, so we went on that journey and it was a pretty fun one because I found out that I could train at even another level. Um, and so we, uh, executed training really well, given the short time frame. And I was really confident in another PB. Uh, I certainly thought I was capable of running at least a 2.22 on Sunday based on the training and comparing to other uh, blocks. Um, so, yeah, we went out um, onto the start line and it, obviously it was <laughs> for everyone that was there. It was pretty cold and pretty wet and, you know, you don't love those conditions. But, you know, like I said, you want to be competitive and just have a race. So my mindset changed from this is a time trial to secure my Olympic spot to this is a competitive race to secure my Olympic spot. So uh, I treated it like a championship race. Uh, I also had the added pressure of um, having one of my teammates, Ellie Pashley, from Australia in the field. So I couldn't afford the pace to get too slow um, and have an opportunity for her to potentially come in and um, join us and then race that. So I really wanted to make sure that I made it as quick as possible and, and really secured that position for Australia. So... Um, yeah, so I probably would have sat in a little bit more had I not also been thinking of the fact that I was trying to, you know, get that Australian Guernsey, but, um, and I wanted to keep that pace honest, but, uh, yeah, I, pro I pushed the pace a fair bit in the latter part. So, um, we sat in as a group, uh, the paces were going out at, uh, 319 per K, which was a little quick, just a, you know, just a fraction quick per K than I was wanting to run. Um, so, but that's not what the lead women decided to run at. So, um, they held back a bit and the pacer was a little ahead. 
So I sat on the lead pack um, and there was a big group of us. Uh, and then as we progressed through the race, uh, the lead women started to slow down a bit. Um, so as they slowed down, you know, in, from about 28K onwards, um, the pace slowed. So I just kept trying to take the lead and push uh, and take, you know, and run from the front and get the pace back into a bit more of an honest uh honest level and then um yeah we would swap leads as we progressed through the race uh we were all together um when i say all together maybe three or four of us um yeah four of us until about or 38 39k i think it was uh and then um at that point uh the first place and second place uh, runners, they took off and I tried to go with them and I held as much on as much as I could. Um, and last year's winner, she dropped off us. And then, um, I was really fortunate. I get towards the end to be able to see Lachlan and my son Pete at a K to go. Uh, cause that's where you've got like the third hill, I think it is, um, in the race. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was a pretty great feeling. Uh, having the opportunity to finish on the podium uh, after finishing fourth last year and just missing a medal last year. Uh, but also disappointing in one way because I was so close to being able to, <laughs> to take silver or gold and, um, yeah, but the legs were, yeah, not, not wanting to do exactly what my brain was telling him to. So, uh, yeah, so I think I got absolutely every inch I could out of myself. Uh, push the pace so at least it could be as honest as possible um, and yeah really proud of of running competitively and and I'm just hopeful now that that's enough to um, to get me a spot okay and so you talked a little bit about treating it like a championship race because it wasn't going to be kind of time trial fast uh, a couple of questions on that uh, for those of us who aren't as familiar with the nuances of the Osaka course how would you best describe it flat and fast rolling hilly what, what would you be your take on it yeah so I had blocked a bit of it out from last year I couldn't quite <laughs> remember all the hills you know you run it oh, okay. you only remember certain bits and when I was running it the second time I was like oh there's another hill <laughs> You know, so, um, and I know a lot of the Australians came over, a lot of my friends came over to run and said, oh, I'm running Osaka, it's going to be fast. And I was thinking, oh, Osaka's great and I love it. Like I've been to Osaka women's twice and I've ran this twice and and so I love being here. But I was thinking, I don't know if it's that fast as, you know, like it's – it's not completely flat. It's a great course and I've ran really well here. Um, but I was kind of worried that people were from Australia or my friends were running it because they thought this was, you know, a bit like a, a Valencia type course. Um, but yeah. And so, uh, when, yeah, when everyone came over, I said, you do know there's some, some hills in this run. Um, yeah. So we, and, and you've got to, you know, just look out for them. And I was able to give them a few tips here and there, but I think it's a great course. I think it's what a marathon is all about, you know. I mean, it's great to have courses like Valencia where you just time trial and, you know, you can test yourself out on a really flat and, and slightly downhill in some spots um, course. But, you know, or you can go and run a Berlin, which is, you know, dead flat and, and super fast and run with world record holders. But championship racing is not like that, you know. Championship racing is more like an a cycle course, you know. You have turns you have hills you have ups and downs and um you know and I, I like that kind of race because it's you know it's what you need to train your mind to be able to uh, compete and be able to change your focus and um, get through the harder bits and strategize and things like that so um yeah so Osaka is a wonderful race to run um as are many and they all have their differences. Um, you know, I've ran 25 marathons, I think, now. So I've competed in different locations. Uh, but, yeah, I wouldn't say it's the fastest marathon I've ran. I think you still, you know, if you want to run significant PBs, you're still looking at your Berlin and your uh, Valencia courses to, to get that opportunity to, you know, take out the variables of the hills and other things. All right. And so then how did the choice of Osaka kind of fit in with the way that Australia selects uh, its uh, Olympic team for the marathon? They don't have a, uh, a trial system like we do in the United States here and it's selection based. Um, how 
well does uh, the selection committee take into account the nuances of a race like Osaka? Yeah, so it's a little confusing for me this year. So, and and I'm not sure how other people feel about it, but uh, it, it's a bit of a race to the death with, this, with okay. Australia, right? Um, mm-hmm. So, and that's I don't think that's the intention of our federation. I don't think I think my understanding is they want to be able to pick the most competitive team, um, and they want to give everybody an opportunity equally to demonstrate their ability. So I, I don't think they necessarily um, have put the policy together in such a way that and set the dates to then, you know, make it difficult for us. I really believe they're trying to get as much data as they possibly can to select the most competitive team. Um, what we're not clear on is um, this is the first year where we've had more than three, you know, people stand out in terms of times. So in the past, we, you know, I've been to four Olympics and in the past it's been pretty clear cut as to who the top three fastest are and so it's probably just been a time decision. But this year is a lot trickier because we have multiple runners who have got the time um, across different of different periods. So when Sinead ran her time back in 2022, we didn't even know that the window for the Olympic selection was open. Um, and that was in 2022, which is a long time ago. But she's our fastest Australian and, um, you know, she's ran 221, which is awesome, right? So, um, but then once again, she hasn't had a chance to prove her fitness um, more recently because she's tro- been troubled with some injuries, which, you know, we all go through and it's it's pretty hard in the lead up to the Olympics. So, um, yeah, so, so there's Sinead, then there's obviously Jen, Eloise, um, Izzy, and myself who all ran um, Valencia. Um, I got COVID in the lead up but still managed to run a really fast time. And um, then, you know, Jen's done really well in her second marathon in Valencia. But once again, that's the fastest course in the world. So it's like, you know, how do you rate that course versus everything else? Um, Then we've got um, obviously Ali and I ran against each other. Um, And then world champs, um, you know, I was the fastest Australian by about six minutes beating Izzy. So, um, yeah, so it's so difficult to for the selectors in Australia to uh, work out what they're going to do, I guess. But um, I feel like I have ran and proven in three Olympic qualifiers on different courses plus the world champs uh, position where I chose to run world champs as opposed to do, you know, another event as did, you know, others. So I feel like I've proven that I'm the most competitive. Um, And so I don't think it would be wise to do another marathon, but I know that there is a risk now. Um, There is a risk that I could get, you know, someone else could run faster in the coming weeks and, I could, you know, not be in the top three. Um, the other thing I guess that's been a bit, con- you know, confusing for us is uh, we originally thought that January 30 was the time so that the World Athletics quota system finished at January 30 and if you were in the top three spots then, you know, I, I thought that that was the team. Um, but then subsequently they're keeping the window open until the end of May. So um, we don't get to plan um, you know, there's so many things that I need to do from a work perspective, you know, and to take time off and, and prepare and prepare Pete and all of those things. I, I'm a little unsure as to what to do now, um, if I'm honest. So, yeah, so it's, it's a tricky one. But Asaka, to answer your original question, was all about um, not doing one too close So uh, to the Olympics because I really want that build to follow a traditional, my traditional build. I want to do some 10K races and um, get that 10K speed top notch and then build that into and then work weave that into the marathon block. Uh, I ran something like, I don't know, four Olympic qualifiers or some, or five Olympic qualifiers in, in times. I know not necessarily in the period, but in the last six marathons, I think I ran or qualifies or some ridiculous stat. Um, and so I feel like I've done a lot of marathon training and I want to have a bit of an opportunity to reload and, and take that my time into the Olympics rather than chucking another marathon back into the mix again uh, and then being really tired or injured or, you know, or the like for the actual games. 
So I suck if you in really well and I've been here before and I love the, you know, the people that look after us here and, uh, yeah, and it's an easy trip from Australia. We don't, you know, Europe just throws in things, you know, difficult, a bit more difficult to you in terms of travel and getting COVID again or something crazy like that, you know. All right. And then, um, I mean, with the Olympic course, uh, that's not going to be a flat and fast course. Uh, and it's no. also going to be a very, very hot uh, time of year to be running as well. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like some of your best races, I mean, in, in your prior Olympics, those were all hot races as well. And in the world champs, you did really well there. Do you consider yourself a hot weather runner? I think I run better in the warmth than I do in the really <laughs> cold. Um, so it was good to prove that I could, you know, that I could run in the cold on the weekend really well. So, okay. <laughs> uh, so that was good. Uh, but yeah, I probably am more suited to the warmth, uh, as long as I do the prep. So I need to be not in Australia, um, for the prep, uh, for a longer period of time for this Olympics. So, um, yeah, a big block now somewhere else that's cause it's too cold where I live in Australia, I live in Melbourne and. Uh, I get too cold through those June, July months. We need to be um, away probably from uh, mid-May uh, right through to the Olympics to really get that acclimatisation. I think being small is a real advantage if you're a small runner. My coach Dick has always said to me, um, you know, you're going to run better, you're going to dissipate heat better because you're little. Uh, and I think that really, you know, puts me in good stead. I haven't hit the wall and I've been able to really – um, pace myself well. Uh, with this Olympics, though, I will be taking a few risks uh, because, you know, I feel like I'm in the best shape of my life. I feel like I've got a really good opportunity to run really fast and, um, you know, finish in a great spot. So, um, yeah, I'm really pumped about this Olympics if I get the opportunity to be selected because I think everything's coming together really well. And Maybe it's too early to start thinking about it yet, but if you're thinking about going somewhere else, in other words, Northern Hemisphere, to, to get ready for the Olympics, are there some places in mind that you'd like to go? Yeah, look, we talked about a few places. We talked about going to Boulder for a bit. We talked about um, going and joining the team at the Asics House for a little bit. Um, in Fort Remote, that'd be pretty fun, um, but not warm enough, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that some of the athletes may from Australia may try to go to St. Moritz. So that's another option. I haven't been there either. Uh, but I think what, where we will land is to go with, um, this is going to sound really interesting, but um, to go with my coach Dick Telford and the 1500 meter boys um, and probably go to Germany and um, get into more warm weather. I think that's really important for me to, to do that rather than the altitude. Uh, and yeah, so, uh, we've been having a few jokes cause, um, obviously if, uh, Cam Myers, the, the youngster from our squad makes the team and I make the team, then we're two ends <laughs> of the spectrum, uh, okay. in both distance and age. So, uh, there you go. it'll be pretty fun. We can, uh, we can go over with the gang and be kids again, right? <laughs> yeah. All, all bases covered. Teach us how to have fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Us parents. Uh, well, I mean, I think that, I mean, it would make a lot of sense to be in well, any of those places that you mentioned time zone wise would probably be a lot helpful too, just to get used to uh, what the time zone and acclimating over to Paris. But I understand you do have a Chicago connection as well. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to put it out there. Chicago is a yeah. pl great place to run. And if you want to run hot, it gets hot here in the summer too. Yeah. Yeah. So my husband, Lachlan, he went to Rice University in Houston and to college. And, and so, and then he has friends, which are fortunately for me, my friends now too. Um, and, uh, they grew up in Chicago and, and so he'd been on breaks from university with, um, with the family. And so he knew the Chicago area. Uh, and when I ran Chicago, when we had the opportunity to run Chicago a couple of times, he said, oh, let's go out to Boosie Woods and, you know, stay around that area and run there. So um, we've been uh, fortunate and, and Pete's been with us as well there. So we've been fortunate to come run around um, that amazing park and uh, we love it there. I wish I could pick that up and take that home with me <laughs> uh, because it's such a beautiful spot to run. 
Yeah, I, uh, I've only run there a, a few times. My wife and I used to live in downtown Chicago. We recently moved out to the suburbs. And so I'm exploring some new places to run. And I know a lot of people do train out there. And I did a group run out there with some some people over the weekend. And then all of a sudden, your husband was messaging me. He's like, oh, I love that place. And I was like, how does this guy from Australia know Bussy Woods? Like, that, there's no way. There's no way. And then he was telling me the story. And it's just, so, so the running makes the world such a, a small place in a good way, uh, I always like to say. It, it does. Yeah, when the last time I ran Chicago, unfortunately, I got food poisoning. So it was a bit bad. But, <laughs> um, but the actual lead up was fun. And the uh, we were running along doing the last work out and one of the guys from the Berlin Marathon who organizes all the timing was there and I was doing some 1k repeats and um, he said to Lachlan he said oh I think she's running about you know 307 is that right and he said oh my and Lock said my gosh like how did you you know how did you work that out we're just looking at her but it turned out he was and he was exactly correct and it turned out he was the timer for Berlin Marathon so we were out there just chatting after the workout about, you know, running and Berlin and what he does. And, yeah, so it was pretty pretty cool to just be in this park, you know, somewhere that we're not from and you just bump into like-minded marathon running, you know, um, friends, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool running what it does. It brings everyone together. Yeah, that's awesome. And then you mentioned your son's been out there too? He has, yeah. He was a little one then uh, when we went to Chicago. Uh, yeah, so we had we've we've been a couple of times, and uh, he's yeah. I mean, he's just we we laugh about you know we when or if we finally retire, I guess um, we laugh about what the holidays are going to be like for him because we've set the bar far okay. too high <laughs> with going to places like New York and Chicago and <laughs> Japan. <laughs> yeah. So we're like, well, um, it's <laughs> Now yeah. he's he's still I guess maybe a little on the young side to be getting into competitive running but you're a runner your husband's a runner is he showing any interest in the sport at all or is just does he want nothing to do with it how how is he uh, approaching it Yeah well he loves all the things at school that involve running so I suspect there is something there I don't know you know what that looks like or you know where that will go but he starts he's 9 uh and he starts competitive school sports um next year so uh i think that's where he'll start to like get that feeling of what you know what he likes and what he doesn't i think he's more going to be an individual sport kind of kid as opposed to a team one uh, but we'll see uh but because everything that he loves about the trying the different sports um is all the running part less about the kicking the ball or you know hitting it hitting something so, um, yeah, so we'll see how it goes, but I think it's not until next year where he really tries things that we'll know for sure what he wants to do. Um, and also I'm really, really against pushing uh, kids into things. I, I started running at 15, 16, and I'm 45, so I really think that it's important that they decide what, what they want to do and that they ask to do, you know, we'll support him in any passion he has, but... I don't want it to be him running because we run. So, yeah. Yeah, like my my daughter is a little bit older. She's twelve. My older daughter, and uh, I kind of was hoping she wouldn't get too into running because there's plenty of time for her to enjoy running in her lifetime. Yeah. Uh, but it turns out she really likes it a lot, and so I'm like, yeah. well, okay. I guess yeah. well, I mean, I'm like, I'm not I'm not upset, you know, about it. Like I love going <laughs> to the track meets and. I like like with like what you were saying. I always kind of thought she'd be a uh, kind of individual sport person because she liked swimming quite a bit as she was uh, younger. Uh, but she's trying basketball for the first time this year, and she seems to really enjoy it. So I'm like, oh, great! Yeah. Um, as long as she's happy and she's having fun out there, um, I'm all for it. I like watching yeah. basketball, and sixth grade girls basketball is um, you got to really love the sport to to, <laughs> to enjoy watching that game. But but I'm having fun out there, and it looks like she's having fun too. Oh, that's um, awesome. I do have one one more like kind of like child related question, and I think this is mainly because I do, frankly don't know that many Australians who have kids. Uh, it's not a bluey question though. Uh, the question <laughs> is: so during like during the pandemic, a show that my kids both started really enjoying was a show involving Australian kids who solve crimes called Investigators. Okay. Have you ever yeah. seen that show, or does your son watch that show? 
He hasn't, but I have seen it. I have, yeah, I've, okay. I've yeah. <laughs> it's just, I, I just, I just needed to know if that was like, like you know, I, I don't know about like Australian television. Like I couldn't tell if that was like a show that came out ten years ago or if that's like a current show or what. So I just didn't know. Like depending on how old your kids were, that would give me a sense of like when did that show come out in Australia versus when did we get it over here on Netflix in the U.S. Yeah, it's recent. I think I, it's okay. not ten years ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. It's just a show. I, personally, I really like the show too, and I just wish <laughs> I, I just wish. I, I wish there were more seasons, and I was thinking maybe if you were a fan, maybe you would know if more seasons are coming. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> okay. yeah, we have some good kid stuff here. That's for yeah. sure. Maybe we're all just big kids, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's get. We can, we can get back to running now. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you for indulging me. Uh, let's talk a minute about the shoes that you wore for for your race. Uh, now, I think at the time you were running, the shoe was officially called uh, Asics Metaspeed Prototype. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what the shoe is now that uh, some more information has become available, at least publicly? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have had a couple of prototypes uh, to try out to see what they're like and provide feedback on. Uh, and so I have the Sky. It's now the Paris version of the Sky, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I couldn't wear the new one, um, that everyone has access to as of this weekend because it's getting launched this weekend, which is so cool. Um, so it was a bit early with Osaka to be able to have the, the fancy new color and, you know, be part of that, that Paris one. So we'll have to wait and wear the new one in, uh, you know, a shorter race before the Olympics and then onto the Olympics. So I've tried the edge and I've tried the speed over the, you know, over the last few years where, you know, they've become the two shoes of choice for racing. Uh, I probably should be wearing the edge if we talk about high cadence because I'm so small. I, you know, have to move a length a lot faster <laughs> than a tall person. <laughs> um, but I find the sky more comfortable. So um, I guess the tip there is to try both before you make a call if you've never worn them before to make sure that, you know, and, you know, use the have an opportunity to, try them out in the store where you can run on a treadmill or, you know, run through the store, not knock people over, but, you know, at least get that feel for what, what they're like because, yeah, just going with the theory I, isn't necessarily always correct um, because in my case I, I felt more comfortable. Um, I didn't, you know, I felt at home really in the sky. Um, I like the new version because uh, it has a bit more responsiveness, um, but the biggest thing for me, which might be, you know, a, an unusual feature, is I find that it's a bit more supportive in my arch and I have um, on my right side from a netball injury as a child, um, I have uh, I roll in on my right side, which is quite significant. Um, and so to have that little bit of support in the arch for me, it's it's not a supportive shoe as such. It's not like a Keanu or things like that, but there's just a little a little bit there that just gives me that extra bit um, where my foot's not flattening. So um, I love it for that reason because I seem to pull up better from um, not having to do all the work that my orthotics normally do in my Nova Blast. So, yeah, so I love it for that reason. Uh, I seem to pull up really well and, hey, I ran Valencia and then, uh, what is it, seven weeks later, <laughs> I ran Osaka and got a medal. So, uh, yeah, ASICs, you're doing something right. Um, and I certainly, and I, I think at Budapest at the World Champs, uh, the guys were asking me about the shoes and giving me some feedback and what do I want in the next shoe? And I just said, please just make them as fast as possible. So uh, I think they're doing a good job of that. <laughs> awesome. And then in, in Budapest, which was last summer, uh, were you in the Sky Plus, the last version of the Sky, not, but, but yes. not the Edge? Yeah, I was in the last version. Yeah. Okay, so you haven't switched over about between? No, okay. no. Yeah, I've tried the edge each time just to make sure that, you know, that I shouldn't, you know, I, maybe I should be in them just because of the high cadence, but uh, I still like the, the sky. They just seem to work for me. So, yeah, go go with them. So I'm more of a mid to, to heel striker. Um, so I don't get that, you know, that toe off that others get from the carbon plate as much. Um, you know, when you're a toe runner, you tend to get a bit more 
push out of your um your carbon plate too whereas i'm i you know i get more responsiveness from the foam because of the way i hit the ground can't change that unfortunately <laughs> and then you also mentioned that you you mentioned like the Nova Blast and also the Kiana are those two other shoes that you put into your rotation uh i run in the Nova Blast pretty much all the time and okay. the Super Blast so <laughs> not so much the Kiana i tried them and they're really comfortable uh, but i have to wear orthotics so i can't wear the Kiana because then mm. i'm a bit overcorrected um, so yeah, so I, I stick with the Nova. I just love the Nova Blast. They're just so comfortable. Uh, I like to throw in the Super Blast um, for some runs just to change things up a little bit. Um, I find that they are comfortable on uh, easier long runs. So if I'm not trying to do efforts, then mm -hmm. I'll, I'll wear the Super Blast. But if I'm trying to do some marathon paced efforts in a long run, then I'll wear the Nova Blast. Um, because, you know, I'm just kind of, they're like slippers, <laughs> you know, okay. they're like, uh, yeah. you know, they're that comfort shoe, I think. Uh, the, okay. everyone, it... Every runner, I think, has their comfort shoe. Oh, yeah. And for me, that's the Nova Blast. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So is it just the three shoes then in your rotation, mainly Nova Blast and Super Blast, and then every once in a while for race day, you're, and is it pretty much only for race day, or is it in workouts too that you're reaching for your carbon-plated shoes? Yeah, I wear the skies in my workouts also. Okay. So I wear them twice a week. I'll do the okay. track workouts. Um, I tend not to go into spikes for track workouts because I'm not right racing a track race at the moment. Um, I really wanted to, that was my original plan this, um, this season, uh, before the whole COVID Valencia situation. But, um, yeah, so I've got a few pairs of spikes that I want to pull out as well, but I tend to run my, interval work um midweek that so the midweek a longer session in the skies and um a track workout in the skies also okay uh great um one other thing that i want to talk about is and it's something that it seems to get brought up in a lot of the interviews of, of you that i've heard so far is that uh being a professional runner is only part of your job. Uh, being a mom is only part of your job as well. Uh, you also are an associate partner at IBM, uh, which seems like a very serious day job. Uh, how are you balancing all of this work or balancing maybe not even the right word? I, I never think of it as balance in terms of like splitting the clock or the 24 hours of the day. Like how are you figuring out how to get through your days and weeks with such a rigorous demand on your schedule? Yeah, so I guess it's one of those things that I don't know a different life. So it's not uh, from a, you know, youngster doing, you know, going to college and getting that done and then and running. And then and back in the day, then I was injured a lot because I wasn't recovering enough and I was trying to be in multiple places at once and, you know, hold down a part time job to pay for college and, you know, all of that as well. So it was pretty, my whole life has been pretty crazy from day dot. Um, but, you know, then we moved into full time work and progressed through as a graduate. Um, I think my, for my first job, I was probably working about six to five hours a week, uh, proving myself as a professional in IT. And then, um, you know, as we've progressed, as I've progressed through the ranks, I've just been used to working. Um, I haven't probably gotten the best out of myself in, you know, my thirties really because pre pandemic, because we were in the office from, you know, eight 30 in the morning to at least five, um, most days. And, and so trying to train at 6am and train at 6:30 PM, uh, makes it for a long day and you're not getting the best out of yourself from, you know, from some of those workouts. Um, you know, some of the days in the winter months trying to train you know, at 6.30 at night and then finish at, you know, 8.30 and get home at 9 is pretty late um, and then back it up again the next day and then go to work. So um, I'm pretty proud of what my husband and I have achieved um, up to the pandemic given that kind of schedule um, with a lot of support from mum and dad well, once we had Pete, you know, they were able to pick him up from kinder and things like that. Um, but I think the pandemic, even though it kind of made the world all a little crazy um, and, you know, getting COVID before Valencia was frustrating, uh, it's actually helped organisations see that we can be more flexible and still be productive 
And so being able to do some of my work from home and, and same with Lachlan, do some days from home and some days in the office has really helped my training because I can do those key big workouts, um, that, that one key workout on a Thursday or Friday um, before work but not then have to travel in. Um, it's made such a world of difference. And, um, and then on top of that, being able to have Lock on the bike handing me a drink and, and, you know, encouraging me and, and things like that has been so helpful too. So um, should had we not had the pandemic, we would still probably be in the office, you know, five days a week. And I just don't think I would have been able to get the best out of myself in that situation. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, Pete's at school now. So um, we tend to look at our whole week as a family and then, and then extended family and work out what everyone has to achieve. So my sister, that includes my sister, my nephew, mum and dad, Locke's parents, and we kind of work out, all right, what's everyone got on? This is how we'll look after the boys, make sure they're all, you know, they're getting to where they need to go. These are the days we have to all go in the office. And then we kind of make a bit of a schedule to help each other get to where we need to go. So it's a it's a team, really, a, an extended team to, to get everything done um, so I, I run for ASICs, um, but I don't really pull a salary from it to be able to live. So, um, you know, Locke and I work like, you know, like regular, regular people. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I think the balance there, like it's, although it's challenging because I'm trying to do big things, uh, in both areas, it's good too, because I have a full career, you know, I, I'm not. I don't need to start again. Uh, I never thought that at 45 I'd still be running. So I always thought that it would end and then I would just, you know, focus more on work and on, on and on family. Um, but I'm still running. So, <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's really been great that my career at IBM has been able to keep progressing um, to good heights as well at the same time. I don't have to start a whole new life. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned that, like, having to go to the office before kept you from being the best you could be. That being said, at your not best, you made four other Olympic teams as a, as a marathoner. So, I mean, you were achieving a lot even with having to go to the office too. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, I think just things like just – because we're where we are and all of the championship races are always in the heat apart from one, you know, um, so far in my career, you know, I need to be other places in the yeah. lead up so that I can get, you know, run my best. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly think, you know, what I was able to achieve for Budapest was just the touch of that. And so I'm really excited if I get the opportunity for Paris to, you know, balance that out and, and go away with Dick and really and Locke and the boys and really uh, find out what's possible uh, without all of the other stuff. Um, yeah, because I think this one has the potential to be really big for me. So, um, yeah, I really want that opportunity to do that. I mean, I have a pretty amazing job. I, I really enjoy my job. I look after 200 consultants in Australia and we, um, we help manage IT for all of big businesses in the country. And so it's pretty big and it's pretty full on, but it's also a lot of fun to, to help coach people um, from a professional standpoint as opposed to a running um, standpoint. And, you know, just uh, I love seeing people like achieve amazing things at work like I do um, in running. And so it's kind of a good, even though there's the work me and the running me, um, the skills are pretty transferable. Uh, in terms of coaching and and planning and um, you know development and you know being able to keep going when you've got a tough project and all of those things are really um, interconnected, I guess, from an endurance perspective and a project world. Right, you mentioned like the running you and like the professional you. Now, my my wife was a consultant at IBM for a, a while. She's in house now, but um, so she was. She was in that world a little bit. And I know that every once in a while, there might be like a, 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 cr a potential crossover, like a running type of event, uh, like a 5K or something like that. And I was I used to be a lawyer and every year there'd be a big 5K race for all the lawyers and, and people in the legal community. Has there ever been a crossover where you just show up to an event and we're like, <laughs> surprise everyone and just throw down and be like, I'm going to destroy everyone in this 5K? 
to run with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to enter. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be because yeah. pre- I, I can imagine like show like just kind of from the stories that i've heard from my wife as a woman and in, in a, a kind of like uh technology consulting i can imagine you showing up to a race and a bunch of dudes just being like well you know i've run a couple of marathons so i you know here's what you want to do for this 5k i can imagine how that would would show up <laughs> yeah we have a corporate cup uh, back. Okay. Well, I haven't done it for a while, but we used to have, right. I think it was pre pandemic. Yeah. We have a corporate okay. cup where all of the professional services, uh, mm-hmm. and large corporates kind of race against each other in the city. Okay. Um, yeah, down where our um, main track is at Albert park, but yeah, uh, we haven't had that for a while. Um, that event, okay. but yeah. Well, you embarrassed fun. them so much last time that they were like, we can't <laughs> do that again. Lisa just made a fool out of all of us. <laughs> people that have said hey can you take the everyone you should meet everyone in the office and take everyone for a run and i said <laughs> do you think they're going to turn up to the office on that day if they, if they think that i'm taking them for a run i don't think that's going to be a good way to get people back to work <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. I got, I got a couple of questions. I just kind of want to jump around a little bit. Um, we've already talked about, you've been on four Olympic teams and hoping to make your fifth team. Uh, I know a lot of professional athletes when they do make the Olympics, it's a lifelong dream. A lot of times they'll get a tattoo. Do you have any ring tattoos or Olympic tattoos? Uh, I don't have a tattoo. No, Okay. no, I have jewelry. So oh, yeah, okay. to, yeah. Oh, no, there you, oh, there you go. Now that's a ring. That's nice. <laughs> Amazing. I can take it off and on then. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, have you, I'm assuming that over the years you must have become friends with other multiple marathon or multiple Olympian, multiple time Olympian athletes. Do you know what the protocol is if one is inclined to get like an Olympic rings tattoo? If you make multiple Olympics, do you get multiple tattoos or how, do, how does that, do you know? Do you know? I would assume not. I would assume once, <laughs> because once you're an Olympian, you're always an Olympian. Okay. You know, okay. people will say, uh, some people will say, you know, a, a past Olympian and a, or a um, oh, okay. former, but you're not, oh. never a former. You're you're just an Olympian. So I guess mm-hmm. one tattoo is it. Once you're once you're in, you're in, okay. right? <laughs> okay. And so, do you have the one ring, the one Olympic set of rings for your ring jewelry, or do you get something every time, or how do you celebrate making uh, an Olympic team? We, uh, I think you're really lucky when you go to the Olympics. You get so many different like you get lovely little coins about being part of the team and certificates and um i'm not sure if every team does it but the pocket of your blazer they frame a pocket of your blazer um that you can put on the wall so yeah you get some really amazing um commemorative pieces that you can put on the wall and yeah we tend to and Lachlan um, has, like, I've kept all of my clippings and things from newspapers and magazines and, like, when we moved into our new place, um, he framed everything and put it on the wall in our gym. So we've got some really cool pictures of all the different things that we've done. And so we can see all the old shoes that I wore, like the shoes that I wore from my first marathon and what they look like to now and how, you know, we're like a brick compared to what we wear now. (laughs) Uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool to have all of those types of things and to look at, you know, and the times that I ran in different shoes is really cool. Um, so I've kept all of those shoes as well to, you know, remember and uh, show people down the track when I'm when I'm a grandma one day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can go, look at what we wore. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, a couple, a couple more questions. Uh, just some, some things that uh, about training and and preparing for for Paris because I th- feel like even though you don't know if you're on the team at the moment, you still kind of have to start looking forward uh, in terms of preparations. Um, what do you think uh, you'll be doing specifically in terms of training other than, you know, like there's heat adapt- adaptations. What do you think that you'll be doing to get ready for Paris heat and also the hi- the hills that'll be on that course? Yeah. So one of the things that's super important is a bit more fueling practice. So I'll be doing a fair bit of that uh, just because the difference between running a marathon in Osaka in the cold weather 
you know, you don't need as many electrolytes. So I just need to make sure that my stomach can handle the electrolytes. So I'll be doing a bit of practice that. That'll be key. I'm really lucky to be sponsored by Precision Hydration. So um, I'm working closely with James there. And um, so we'll keep doing that and make sure that I really nail down exactly what every granule <laughs> that I'm going to eat in the, you know, in the few days before and, um, and then every, you know, drink and how I'm going to execute that. So that's one thing that I'm, you know, pretty, pretty keen to try out. Um, the, and to build from what I did. So Budapest was a good trial. So that was one of the big reasons. I mean, I wanted to run another world champs while I was fit and, you know, still, still young. <laughs> um, and, um, but I also wanted to try a plan for that I could then execute at the Olympics. And so I want to build from that. Um, the other thing that we will be doing is making sure we do more hill running. I tend to do, I don't do hill repeats. Um, I found that if I do hill repeats, I just get really sore in my, um, hamstrings and I've torn a hamstring a couple of times just from doing hill repeats. So we don't do those anymore. Uh, but what I will be doing is lots of undulating runs that replicate the type of condition we're going to get. Uh, because, you know, and you still need to run your flat running. Um, you can't just, you know, you don't want to just all of a sudden go crazy and start running hills that, you know, and that's it because you're not getting that balance. Um, so we'll just balance it out and make sure that we have a bit more of that kind of terrain depending on where we're located. Uh, I tend to run a lot of hills anyway in terms of it, all of my runs from home are undulating. Um, I find it more difficult to find flat places to run anyway. So I have to always drive to get something that's like dead flat. So, uh, I don't think there'll be too many changes in that regard. I think it's more about location and just dialing into that hydration strategy, um, and making sure that's absolutely 100% perfect. Now, are you mostly, uh, fluids in terms of your nutrition or gels or how do you normally break that up? And I guess two-part question, like, and how do you plan yeah. on adjusting that for the heat uh, of Paris? Yeah. So I think one thing when you go into a hot weather marathon, everyone is like, oh, you've got to, you know, what some people will, I shouldn't say everyone, some people are like, I've got to be so focused. I've got everything perfect in that plan. So I've got to know exactly what I'm going to put in my bowls and drink everything. And, and, you know, then I'm going to run well. If you go into that without any flexibility, I think it's a bit of a mm. um, risk. So, you know, I can tell you from every hot weather marathon I've ran that you are going to get thirsty and you are going to be running from water stop to water stop towards the end because you are just so hot and you'll do anything to survive and anything to get cool yourself down. So um, I think making sure that there's a good combination of um, gels and, and drink mix is really good. Um, I think from a from a, you've got to balance that whole carb intake with the fluids, but I, I 100% um, know how much fluid you actually take. And it's a lot because it's, you know, Budapest was, as you know, you were there, it's, it was hot. Um, and you just want to keep cooling yourself down. So I think a variety is really good, um, but making sure you practice so that your gut is used to handling it all is pretty uh, key. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I think that's a good place to leave it for today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, good luck to you as we uh, await uh, the announcement or the proclamation from the, the, the selection committee. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, where can people follow you uh, to follow along with your training and to uh, get the news immediately when it comes out in terms of whether you make the team? Yeah. So uh, just at Lisa Waitman at Instagram is, um, yeah easy to find me there and if anyone you know has a question or you know i'm happy to chat so send me a, a you know direct message and yeah it'd be lovely to connect and um follow along on everyone's journey i find it really inspiring um you know looking at what people are up to and how they're combining their professional and family and running life because um it's a pretty mean feat trying to do it all and um so yeah it's nice to inspire each other so I look forward to hearing how everyone's going and thanks right. for having me it's great to chat right. with you all right great to chat with you too thank you so much